Thank you, Peter. Thank you, all of you, for inviting me back. It's been a while. Okay, thank you. But I'm always happy to come and be part of this. You're a wonderful audience uh, through the years, and I appreciate the fact that you've allowed me to sometimes torment you, or whatever you want to call it, with some of my crazy ideas. And the last time I was here, I was just starting the project which I wish to describe today. And that is that I had the idea that we need to reevaluate totally how we talk about the spread of Buddhism. And at the time when I said that a lot of what we say about the Silk Road is probably not true, uh, there was a little gasp from the audience, and later somebody said, you realize this week we're just starting a high school program to teach kids about the Silk Road. <laughs> so my apologies. <clears throat> After I spoke to you, that was the first time that I had described what I'm trying to do to any group. Uh, following that, I went to the University of Virginia and gave the talk which uh, Dorothy Wong put in her volume and published. The question that I raise, and which I still raise, is that we have developed an idea about the Silk Road, which is fine, the Silk Road's important, uh, but the spread of Buddhism cannot be understood just by looking at Silk Road. And this finally dawned on me, and I came here and shared that with you a long time ago. It's really wonderful, the Silk Road. I love it. Dung Huang, all the, the romance of, the, of going along those routes, the, the stories that we tell. Um, but that's not the way to really describe fully how Buddhism spread. So, when you see Campbell caravans, as I mentioned last time I was here, you have to think about what was it like if you put something on a, an animal in China, like silk, and you carried it by animal all the way to the Mediterranean. How would you do that? How much would it cost? How many years would it take for the animal to make that journey? Well, I found some support for what I was working with by the Orbis Project at Stanford. The Orbis Project did a really wonderful and great study. They looked at the cost of shipping a kilo of grain to Rome. And I didn't realize this, that the records in the Roman Empire for all that grain shipment is still available. So they went through all those records, and they came up with a very interesting conclusion. Grain that was 20 miles from water was too expensive to ship to Rome. 20 miles from water. It had to be with a river or the ocean. Otherwise, the cost of the grain shipment was too expensive. If you cannot ship a kilo of grain 20 miles, what can you ship 5,000 miles and have it without water? <laughs> and have it so that you can even afford it? Well, one of the things that have always amazed people is if you go to Iran today or Persia, you find all these shards in the ground, but they are shards of very cheap Chinese pottery. How did that heavy, cheap pottery get to, to that place? If you figure out that you're going to load it on camels or horses and carry it there, how much is it going to cost you to do cheap pottery 
thousands of miles. Well, of course, now that we have the shipwrecks that are beginning to show up, lo and behold, we have our answer. That is, the shipwreck which contains tons of cheap Chinese ware on its way to Persia from China. And the records tell us that 90% or more of the trade between China and Persia was from the sea. It's, it, the, the statistics are beginning to mount with us. And today, if you track all the sea travel that's going on, this basically is what it looks like. You can see between Europe and Asia the patterns that are existing there. Well, those, some, many of those patterns are the pattern of the spread of Buddhism. In other words, we need to look to trade, we need to look to the organization of how people communicated with one another. We have that wonderful document that they found <coughs> in Austria, which is a first century letter of credit written on papyrus, and it says, we have what they've now added up to be 400 tons of goods. We are going to ship these from Musurs, that is Western India. We're going to ship it over to Africa. We're going to carry it by camel from the coastline to the curve in the River Nile. We're going to put it back on water at that curve of the River Nile. We are going to float it down to Alexandria. We will pay 25% of it as tax. No wonder Cleopatra was the richest woman on earth. And if your agent is there and gives us the money, we will give you the goods, otherwise we will keep them. This was like an international letter of credit in the first century in which people were willing to ship 400 tons of goods and it came by water. We also know that King Solomon was trading with India because in the Hebrew Bible, the Song of Solomon, we have words which are Tamil, not Hebrew. The Bible has Tamil words for things which the, they had no local example of, and so they had to take the name of its location. So peacock was one of them. The word in the Bible for peacock, for apes, for ivory, they are all Tamil words, South Indian words. In other words, we live in a world in which for a long time goods have been distributed long distances, and those Goods do not necessarily have to take the people or the culture with them, but they often take their name because you have no local name for them. The other thing that <clears throat> raises a question is Roman gold coins. We read in the Roman records, alas, alas, our treasury is being emptied of all its gold because it's being shipped to the east. Now, if you empty the Roman treasury of all of its gold, that's got to be quite a bit, right? So in the digs in China, what do we find? For a long time, they found 16, 16 Roman coins at Xi'an. Since then, they've been digging in central China and across, they've found 90-some coins. Mainly, they find them with corpses. In other words, they were not so much commercially being used as ritually being used. And not only that, but many of these coins are fakes. They have been manufactured probably by the Sasanians, 
They are of a very poor, poor quality, but you can tell these are not from Rome itself. So the question is, where did the coins go that went from Rome east? And of course, the answer is South India. South India, where we find thousands of Roman coins. Caches of them turn up all the time. And it makes good sense when you look and understand that to ship huge amounts of goods which would generate the payments that we're talking about, it had to be by sea, not by land. There is trade by land, we know that. People live by land, so it's local trade. It's sequential trade. People trade with their neighbors back and forth. And products will pass slowly through that kind of trade system. But people don't make a living from that. Their living is made by trading locally because they've got to have some money every week, every month. <laughs> they can't wait for something to pass through, even if it's very expensive. So that's why I began to think about we need to understand what this sea travel and sea trade means in terms of the Buddhist tradition. <clears throat> It wasn't easy to travel by sea. Here are all the records of, and we certainly can understand this today, of all days, the monsoons which produced the typhoons. You can see that the Bay of Bengal and even the Indian Ocean between Africa and India were filled with ancient records of typhoons. And they didn't have CNN to tell them when it's going to hit. It just came upon them. We are constantly under trying to deal with how things happen. I realized, I used to ask the question, how in the world, if Buddhism traveled with merchants, which we now believe was the case, what did, you, what did they do? Did they go down to the port and say, I want to take a trip. Did they have to pay? If somebody took them from a port in India to Sri Lanka or from Sri Lanka to Sumatra, did they pay? But when I recently read the studies of, of the sailors of today who are on these huge ships that have containers on them, the psychological issues which those sailors face I think is very similar to what the ancient sailors faced. Loneliness, fear of sickness, psychological isolation for long periods of time, and the fear of what would happen in a storm. The fear of what would happen that would be uncontrolled. And so the container ship companies are having to figure out how in the world to help their sailors keep their sanity. It's a big issue for them. It's no small issue. So I realized from that that the sailors in the past must have had similar issues. And what they wanted was somebody who carried the power of the spiritual world, who could protect them. Come on up get on board, <laughs> it's free. You don't have to pay anything if you'll just go with us and help protect us and guide us through what we're going to go through, which are all these storms. And when you look at the storms of the world, we are still facing it. <laughs> we understand today perhaps more than we've ever understood before what it's like when you suddenly find yourself trapped in typhoons or hurricanes. It is horrendous. And these people faced it all the time. So that the, having a monk with them would be considered really helpful. However, the monsoons did determine how trade was carried on, when it was carried on. If you wanted to get from Africa to India, you had to go when the monsoon blew toward India. Then you had to wait until the monsoon turned, so it took you a year before you could get back. 
But each year they tell us that off the Horn of Africa, there would be up to 200 ships out there waiting for the first sign that the monsoon wind was coming to blow them to India. And it took them, they didn't have to navigate. It absolutely took them to the Indian coast. <clears throat> we know that um, the trade was very early. We can go inland and now with the archaeological evidence. For example, this looks just like a pond. It's more than five miles inland now. But it was the ancient dock that had ships coming from Africa to India docked here. This was the dock. Now it's just a pond. So the silty is a big issue. Well, after I had this idea and I presented it here, um, I was told, and rightly so, um, this is interesting speculation. <laughs> That's an idea. It's all right. Um, but what's your data? What, what data do you have to show that Buddhism had a maritime element? And I had to face up to the fact I had some data, but not much. My original idea had been stirred by sitting and reading the archaeological reports in Chennai from the Archaeological Survey of India, but it was just my impression of reading a few hundred, but reading a slight number. So after I decided I should not go forward with this until I had data, and if I had no data, I should drop it. So I used my research money. I went to the Archaeological Survey of India. We hired teams of young archaeologists who were young enough not to know better and <laughs> sent them out with GPS, a computer, and a camera. And we had them exactly locate every Buddhist artifact every Buddhist site, any Buddhist element which had been noted by the Archaeological Survey of India. So when I sent them out, I said, all right, I don't know what they're going to find. <laughs> they may find that <clears throat> my original idea, which is that I predicted we are going to find that the Buddhist sites will cluster at seaports. And I wasn't at all sure that it would show that. <laughs> it both showed it and it didn't. That's why data is for you. It feeds you and then it bites you. Um, what it did show, though, was, yes, the major clusters of Buddhist sites were at seaports. But they also followed the rivers so that you had both seaport Buddhism and riverine Buddhism, if you wish. Up the rivers that were connected to those ports, you can track all of the Buddhist sites that are along those rivers. So we get both, but the clustering looked real. Then, of course, people start to question, and one of the things they said was, all right, all right, South India, sure. <laughs> You get this clustering in South India, but it won't, it won't work for the rest of India. It will not show such clustering. So we've only been able to afford to run a couple of little tests. One is we ran a test up in the northwest where all the beautiful Buddhist caves are. And we thought if there's any place where the Buddhist sites will cluster inland, it should be on those trade routes that were actual physical land routes with these beautiful caves. Must have been a lot of things. But lo and behold, even there, we have found that the Buddhist sites cluster at the seaport. We then went up north of our 
site in South India, and as we went around along the area, we found that almost everywhere we were looking, we were still finding the clusters at the sea with the river routes going inland. And otherwise, you would have large areas where we had no record of any Buddhist site. So what does it mean to say that Buddhism is coastal? <laughs> Who ever thought that it was coastal? The sites that are there are, are impressive. For example, there was once a Chinese pagoda in India. It was finally torn down by the Jesuits in the 19th century. Whether they tore it down because it was about to fall down, I don't know, but it got torn down. We have the drawings of it. And the sites that we looked at were not just insignificant. Archaeological evidence under that had been dug showed monastic structures of sizable proportions. So then I'm left with this. My data tells me that Buddhism is really coastal <laughs> in large parts of India. What do I do with that information? Because we have the Silk Road. We have all the Buddhist sites like Dunhuang Caves and all of those sites throughout Inner Asia. So I came up with the idea of calling it the Great Circle of Buddhism. That Buddhism, if you drew a circle around all the places that had once been dominantly Buddhist, in a sense you would have a, a circle, of course it's jagged edges, but... And when you come to look at the circle of Buddhism, you realize that a large percentage of the circle's edge is coastline. The coast defined Buddhism in many, many instances. Naturally, because there was, that's where places were were put. What's been surprising to me, though, is to go back and look at the Great Circle and realize that the really important part of the Great Circle is often its rim, not its interior. That the absolute limit of where Buddhism went, for example, in, in Inner Asia, the absolute limit are these little routes that the caravans went through in Central Asia. Very narrow. <laughs> but that's where the Buddhist activity was. And if you look at the seacoast, and you look at those, you see that the activity was really clustering at seaports. So that in one strange way, it seems like you have this really active rim around Buddhism, where the trade was flowing and the seaports were flowing, and that things were then moving from that inland, rather than it being focused interior and going outward like this. <clears throat> I think the, the story of the two merchants who came upon Shakyamuni just after he had decided that he was going to uh, start eating and then became enlightened, here came two merchants. And those two merchants who came by collected some hairs from his beard. Some records say two. And those merchants with those two hairs, we now find huge structures in Sri Lanka and in Thailand that were built just to hold those relics. In other words, the merchants who f came upon the Buddhist turn out to have been maritime merchants, <laughs> if you wish. But the story itself became maritime. So. We have the Sri Lankan site, and we have that famous stupa in the middle of Yang'an, Shwedagaon. The only reason it's there is to hold the two hairs those two merchants found 
from the Buddha. That's why it's built. So the merchants tell us a lot. So slowly we began to develop where would we do the research on the centers. They would be, we decided, in some cases, riverine, and in other cases, seaports only. So we began to put some dots on the map as we started to collect our data and began to work. Our issue was to say, <clears throat> we are now looking at the spread of Buddhism from the point of view of the sea and what trade and travel and issues developed. And so we now need to document it. <clears throat> so we finally made the decision to start the project, the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. The Atlas of Maritime Buddhism has two components. One of them is that it has an internet issue which will be for research, in which we will put as much of our data as we can and make it long-term available. Because of the issue of preservation of data, we have moved all of that to Academia Sinica in Taiwan to the GIS center there. It seems to us that that is one of the most safest places to put our data. So that's where the data for that aspect of the atlas now resides. And it will be made free and available to everybody who wants to use it. Um, so. Let me describe some of the projects to see what we're putting into these things. The first one. Atisha, one of Tibet's most famous teachers, lived in the Bay of Bengal, was born there. And in his writings, he said, I can't find a teacher. I've looked everywhere for a teacher, and I can't find one. 10th century, Bay of Bengal, can't find a teacher. Huge, big, monastic institutions all around him. They had not yet been destroyed, they were there. <laughs> and yet he said, I can't find a teacher. Where can I find one? The records that he wrote said, I found that the teacher who could teach what I wanted to know was in Palembang in Sumatra. And so Atisha left the Bay of Bengal and set forth for Palembang. We don't know a lot about Sumatran Buddhism. That's a real blank in Buddhist studies but it is one of the key issues for understanding how Buddhism developed, and particularly Palembang, which was the capital city of the Sri Vijaya kingdom. We need to know as much as we possibly can find out about it. So the fact that we have these remains, and these are the kinds of things which we're photographing, but we're also went through, for example, the entire literature in Tibetan for Atisha, and we made a map of his journey and what he did. Atisha traveled to Palembang. There he found his teacher. He stayed there for 12 years until his teacher died. He then went to Sri Lanka, and from there back to the Bay of Bengal. Everybody was very excited to have him. But the people over in Nepal said, oh, come over and teach us. So they finally talked him into saying, come over to Nepal, come to Kathmandu, teach us about this new stuff you've learned, which was tantric, Kala Chakra Tantra from Palembang. Please come and teach us. So he went over, and before you know it, they said, you know, there's a pass through the mountains here, 
And the people over in Tibet are so anxious to hear what you have to say. And they are really backward, according to the records that he wrote. They need your teaching. So Atisha crossed over into Tibet, spent the rest of his life going back and forth across the plains of Tibet, and he taught what he had learned in Sumatra. Kala Chakra Buddhism and the tantric tradition that dominates the Tibetan tradition turns out in one way to be maritime Buddhism. <laughs> when you tell this to Tibetans sometimes, they're really kind of taken aback and stunned. They say, oh, we knew he went to Sumatra. Yeah, but 12 years, really? He stayed there? Yes. <laughs> you read your records. So the famous places that Atisha went out and taught his Kalachakra Tantra really have their roots in maritime. It's surprising to me as I work with these projects how often I don't think I'm going to find it's maritime and lo and behold, there it is. If you want to study Theravada Buddhism, you have to understand that the Theravada Buddhist of of Thailand, of Myanmar, uh, of today, is really something constructed in the 15th century by a series of councils. And those 15th century councils were made by people who were going back and forth on the ships from Thailand to Sri Lanka and Myanmar. They were traveling back and forth, communicating with each other, as they tried to find, and their, ro their role was, to reform Buddhism and to take it back to its basic original roots. And those became what we look at today as Theravada Buddhism. Comes from these councils. Once again, the councils are only possible because of the fact that they were on ships going back and forth. As Peter said, I, I recently took a group of students to the Mekong uh, Delta. Akeo is one of the ancient sites in the Mekong Delta. Um, <clears throat> the Mekong River, as you may know, is really one of the world's largest rivers, and it floods every year in its delta. Uh, so the delta is very, very um, fertile. We went there, we discovered that Akeo today is a thousand acre rice field. Beautiful. It's a rice field. If you dig down, the old city walkways and things are underneath the rice. The Chinese in the fourth century went there and they said, here is this very active city on stilts. Maybe we should learn from them. They put their city on big stilts for, the, for each time the river flooded. And they found a city that was vibrant. And then it disappears. And that's something which has always bothered me a little bit, is that very often with Buddhism, I'm talking about ruins. Archaeological ruins. <laughs> cities that have been left behind. And Akeo was one of them. It thrived and then it ceased to thrive. And the answer seems to be technology. They developed ships that could go from Palembang to Guangzhou. Once they had a ship that could go directly without stopping from Palembang all the way to Guangzhou, Akeo was out of, the, out of the loop. It dried up, so to speak. However, one of the things that really amazes me about Akeo is that in the mud, <clears throat> they found huge wooden Buddha images. Some are nine feet tall. They're some of the most beautiful Buddha images I've ever seen. Very professionally done. They are magnificent works of art. And these images, when you look at them, 
and you realize how long they were buried in the mud. <clears throat> and of course, we now know from the bog men that mud is anaerobic. It's, it pulls the oxygen out of things, and it preserves them. And so the data that we now have is that these wooden images are 11% chance that they're third century and 80% chance that they're early fourth or early fifth century. In the wood that is made, they're made from is local. So in this site, we can see what a Buddhist port was like in our thing. That it had artists, and the artists were really doing uh, fantastic types of artistic displays. And we now know that this was going on at the time when the trade and Akio was such a part of it. That Buddhism was there at a very early period. And it wasn't just there, but it was there in, in a position of power and development. Angkor Wat. You could, people say, well, Angkor Wat's a long way from the sea. But as you know, if you've been there, you can take a boat all the way from Angkor Wat down to the Mekong Delta. I don't recommend it. It's very hot. It's very boring. But you can do it. But when we have begun to look at the archaeological sites between the Mekong Delta and Angkor Wat along the river passage, the dots that we find are in the thousands, Buddhist remains. It was a great corridor of Buddhist activity. So that this is riverine type Buddhism in one sense. Uh, I think um, Damien Evans, who's been doing all this work, his work with LIDAR is some of the best and the most exciting. To remove the top of all the shrubbery and the trees and to be able to lift it through the computer so that you see what's underneath the ground that you can never see otherwise that with the ground penetrating radar, you get down to 18 feet. Your computer can take it off inch by inch, and you can follow that image all the way down. When we look at the LIDAR of Angkor Wat, we don't understand a lot of what we see. There's a maze. We don't know what the maze was, but there it is. We don't. We never knew that it was structured exactly this way. So one of the things that's happening is with ground penetrating radar and with this kind of LIDAR effort, archaeology is changing dramatically. So you go to some of the archaeological meetings and one of the question is, question that's being raised is, when do you dig? How much are you going to find out if you dig and destroy the site? Is it better to just use this remote sensing to understand what's there and leave it in situ without destroying the site? And there's a lot to be said for it. So that's one of the areas, of teams that we're working with. We have more than 100 people who are involved in our teams, and Damon is one of them. The other thing is that this trade route had textiles, but textile was not the big issue. The big issue on this trade route was spice. And of all the spices in the world that would make it to the big time, that little vine that grows along every field practically in South India called black pepper, you wouldn't believe it could reach such enormous world uh, renown. So black pepper became an issue. So in one sense, 
if you want to call what these routes something, it's probably better to call them a spice road than a silk road. In terms of the weight of what was shipped, I think spice would outweigh the textiles every time. And of course, <clears throat> we also have nutmeg, that wonderful um, spice that only comes from a few little islands. Um, nutmeg and mace. Mace is the covering for the nutmeg itself. And we go and we buy it, we use it. But the Dutch wanted those islands very much and the British owned them, or at least claimed them. So the Dutch went to the British and they said, what will you take for that spice island? And they said, we've got an, another island someplace. We'll trade you for it. This island is in New York. <laughs> and they traded Manhattan Island for that one spice island. And that's how Manhattan came to be under the control of the British rather than the Dutch. So the Dutch gave up Manhattan to get a spice island because they wanted to control the spice industry. So I think that they should rename Manhattan, you know, after its spice, after all. It seems reasonable. So slowly we began to develop all of our points. We are still in the process of doing this. You can have points on a map and you put all your data under that point and when you click on that point, all your data appears for you. But there's another thing that's more important even than the dots. And that is you have two dots on a map, but you have data which talks about both. So we call this line between two dots an edge. The edge data is often much more important than the dot data. So I can put in all this information about San Francisco, but then I've got Los Angeles, and the relationship that goes on between those two dots is often different, and in some cases much more important than just what is locally for the dot. So we've been working on how to do edge graph. That is how you have your data that says, Something was shipped from here to here, and that's an edge, and it has to go into the edge data rather than the dot data. Believe me, it's very complex. In this case, you see one line that's up there at Nepal, and it comes down, and it goes over to Akeo, it goes over to the Mekong Delta. What do you think was the product being shipped on that line. Horses. Horses. There was an enormous trade of shipping horses from Central Asia to China via the sea. They didn't drive them across the Jinghai Plateau. They took them down the rivers and put them on boats and carried them by boats to Guangzhou and they carried them through Akeo. It was one of the biggest forms of trade at that time. So that edge tells us a great deal. From here to here, horses were shipped. <laughs> and we have to collect that data and figure out what to do with it. So that's been another one of our projects. Another one that I'd like to share is we've been working with, of course, Avalokiteshvara. He is one of the major bodhisattvas for maritime Buddhism, no question about it. Lots of work, and Sanjot here has, has been involved with this, I'm sure, and will be in the future. I have to say that in the National Museum of Sri Lanka are some of the most beautiful Avalokiteshvara images I have ever seen. They are absolutely gorgeous. And they have allowed 
the team in, at the Institute of Archaeology in Sri Lanka to take a little piece of one of those and analyze the metallurgy of the statue. And to nobody's surprise, they found that the copper was from Sri Lanka itself. They found that the tin was from Malaysia. They found the iron was from India. And then they came to lead. And the lead was from the Mediterranean. In other words, in one image, we have the whole of what Buddhism was, was involved with. The trade all the way from the Mediterranean to China. That one image has somehow pulled in through metallurgy all of those metals and they are all put together. And it's sort of symbolic for what we're trying to say about our project. We've been in Sri Lanka. My wife and I were there for a month with the, with the team. We've been filming. Um, Abalukiteshvara and the films are, are fantastic. Some of them are so beautiful. The stories behind them are, are fascinating to me. They have local lore that I don't know anywhere else. The local lore is that Avalokiteshvara had a wife. Her name was Tara. And Tara, of course, we know as another manifestation that basically of, of, of Avalokiteshvara. And that they had a son, Sudhana, from the uh, Avatamsaka Sutra. Sudhana was the young person who was sent out who went on, found 72 different teachers. Uh, Sudhana is the one who covers the Borobudur walls with the story of each of the teachers that he went to. And according to the local lore, he was the son of Avalokiteshvara and Tara. I love these kinds of stories. In, in Sri Lanka, as well as other places, we have done the filming so far for Myanmar. Uh, our team was there for uh, 28 days. We had another uh, more than three weeks in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have done Borobudur and parts of Indonesia. Uh, this coming fall, we will do India and we'll do Thailand at least, and I hope maybe even some Vietnamese. Uh, what we're trying to do, though, is to film, as I'm going to show you later, in a very specific way, to be able to capture as much data as possible and to put that data into both the Taiwanese bank of data that I've talked about, as well as the, another project, which I'll describe a little bit later. As we're doing this, one of the things that we have done is to do workshops to teach local people how to do photometrics. And that is to take the objects in their collection and to do uh, cloud photographing of the objects so that you can make it into a 3D virtual object in your computer. You can turn it upside down and backwards. So we've been teaching uh, the photometrics in Sri Lanka and in Myanmar and India. Sri Lanka, uh, as I indicated before, for example, in many sites we find a lot of Chinese evidence. In other words, the maritime project shows us that the Chinese were meeting the Indians and others in Sri Lanka. But the one site that pleases me the most, and I, well, I've been really moved by this, in a coastal region down in the south, not a very beautiful, not especially beautiful place, but it is the site of the ancient copper mine of Sri Lanka. 
This was where the original copper was being mined, and it was um, a major site. And there is a port there. But recently, the Archaeological uh, Institute in Sri Lanka discovered an inscription on a mountain which they noticed you could stand on that mountain and see the port. So on top of that mountain is this inscription. The Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara stands here, looks out in order to save and preserve the life of sailors. In other words, that's that issue I'd mentioned earlier about the fact that the people look to the Buddhist to be their preservation at sea, nowhere is better exemplified, I think, than at that place where we find uh, this inscription. So it's a wonderful place to stand and just look and imagine. The copper has all been used. It's been mined, it's gone. The port is gone. It's just left there for us to create a <clears throat> religious geographic topology for the area and to describe it in terms which will unite that spot with all of the other spots that we are identifying through our atlas. And then, <clears throat> last one before the break. One of the things that I think the Atlas will do for Chinese Buddhism is to correct the issue of the role of southern China in the development of Buddhism. And whenever I say this in China, all the people from the North scream at me and say, no, no, no. We are the center of Buddhist activity. We always were. This is where the translations were made. This is where it was all happened was up here in Xi'an and... But if you look at the ancient map of the Han Dynasty, see, I've, I've stopped using solid color maps. Solid color maps are the biggest lies ever told. Well, maybe not, but... <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the the map of the actual archaeological sites of Han cities over here, the dark brown, what you see is a network and a system of trade which the Han people engaged in. And that they went out toward the west, you can see it there, but the an even stronger trade pattern went down to Guangzhou, they were developing trade that went over to the river system and over into Yunnan. When you look at Chinese Buddhism today, the things which dominate in Chinese Buddhism and have dominated for some centuries have very little to do with the Buddhism that came into Xi'an in the early days. The Buddhism that we find in China is dominated by Chan, Bodhidharma, Guanyin, nuns, mind-only school. These are the parts of Chinese Buddhism that are dominant today. They all came through the south. Bodhidharma entered China through Guangzhou. For the first time, Chinese women were ordained as nuns because they brought Sri Lankan nuns by ship to China, not by land. They came by ship. And when they didn't have enough to do a full ordination, when you need 10, a couple of them died and they lost their 
no, correct number, they sent a ship to Sri Lanka to bring more nuns so they could have a full ordination. And it took two years for it to go to Sri Lanka, find the nuns and come back, and you could then set up for a full ordination of Chinese women as ordained nuns. Ten monks, ten nuns. It was a double ordination so that the Chinese nuns who traced their origin back to these early Sri Lankan nuns who came are authenticated by the Vinaya tradition. It was a correct ordination. So they came from this site. It's one of our sites that we're going to cover. So I'm saying for China, it's time to look at what went on in Guangzhou, what went on in the coastal communities along the coastline of China. Because Buddhism came through those regions and Buddhism was strongly influenced by it. You take Tantra. A young man named Amoga Vajra came with his father from Central Asia to Guangzhou. They put him on a ship and they sent him to Palembang. And he, like Atisha, studied Tantra. And he was really good. And he translated Tantric texts into Chinese in Palembang and came back to Guangzhou with Chinese text on his ship. Not Sanskrit waiting to be translated, he had already translated it in Palembang and brought it in Chinese into China. So that if you want to understand Chinese Buddhism today, you've got to track these elements. Otherwise, what you will get will be a very strange view of Chinese Buddhism, and it won't make much sense if you go into a monastery in anywhere in China and try to understand what's going on if you're looking at second century texts, it just won't work too well. So this is an introduction to some of the things which we are trying to do. Specific projects, very oriented toward gathering data. As you can see, I'm data oriented nowadays. I don't want to say anything unless I have some data to back me up. So I think it's time for our break. Thank you very much. Thank you.